Welcome back to Wake Up with Nubian Tigers Talk, a podcast brought to you by a group of Black Princetonians, where we discuss issues impacting our Black and Brown communities. My name is Michelle Jacobs, and I'm here as always with my great co-host, Ray Smalls. So, <laughs> you know, so Ray, uh, when we first started the podcast, mm-hmm. we opened it up with an episode on Black home ownership. Yes, right? yes. And yeah. we really haven't had any discussion since then no on what's happening with the housing issue in our communities yeah and you know uh in particular um you know when the pandemic hit and people were now either well those that had wealth were able to leave the city right those that didn't they were stuck in the city and they were still using mass transportation because they had to get back and forth because they were all doing essential services, right, you know? Right, right. So, I, I mean, you know, we couldn't, we couldn't get away from the pandemic the way other people could get away from it. Right, right. And then on top of that, there's the whole issue of uh, lack, lack of stable and affordable housing and people getting evicted and so forth and so on. So we thought it would be uh, a good time to come back around mm-hmm. and look at this issue of housing. So our guest today is Professor Audrey McFarland from the University of Baltimore School of Law. Professor McFarland's research and teaching focus is in the areas of law related to economic development. Her scholarship examines the ways in which economic development is not a neutral policy that the government can advance without addressing significant structural issues related to race, class, and geography. Her most recent works have focused on how mixed income housing reflects social domination and seeks to manage discrimination. She also asked whether constitutional doctrine should evaluate the propriety of exclusionary zoning in ways that account for the developer's role and influence on development decision-making. Professor McFarland obtained her undergraduate degree from Harvard and Radcliffe and her JD from Stanford University. Welcome to the show, Professor Audrey McFarland. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So let's jump right into it. Um, As everyone knows, uh, there's a housing crisis throughout the country right now, Uh, but many of our black and brown communities are being faced with destruction through gentrification. So can you explain to us briefly what gentrification is and some of the factors that drive it? Uh, So gentrification um, is a process by which uh, wealthier, higher income individuals um, move into an area that uh, was formerly working class or um, lower income, and they uh, eventually, through their superior buying power, uh, replace the original residents. So it's it's kind of interesting too, right? Because one of the attractions of people coming into an area is the culture in the area, so forth and so on. And as soon as they come in with the yoga mats, and the dog barks. <laughs> right? And don't forget the roller co- roller carriages. <laughs> yes, and the roller carriages. Um, <laughs> and then immediately try to destroy uh, the the culture uh, and the flavor of the community that supposedly brought them there to begin with. So it, it's a problem across the country. And some cities are uh, experimenting with the idea of mixed housing. Um, where if a new developer comes in, they have to have both uh, market rate housing as well as some uh, affordable housing. So what's your what's your take on that? How well is that working? Um, okay, so once you've noticed that uh, there's a yoga mat store in your neighborhood, it's too late. Mm. That neighborhood has been priced up and is just not no longer going to be affordable. Um, This is actually a phenomenon that, uh, believe it or not, is happening um, in many cities, mostly on the coasts, uh, believe it or not, um, I'd say Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Washington, D.C. has uh, kind of like the worst gentrification or the most pervasive gentrification in the country. But it's actually a global issue. It is happening in 
uh, Western European uh, cities, um, it's happening um, across the globe. So you're looking at this question of where can non-rich people afford to live. In the United States, we, we had um, or have a history of racial segregation, deliberate racial segregation of neighborhoods. So at least initially starting out, um, because of the nature of that racial segregation, you had uh, Black concentrated communities and the prices in those communities would be depressed. Uh, there would be less government investment, there's more decay. And so all of those factors can make uh, those communities um, great buying opportunities uh, for people um, who now see, well, look, uh, that architecture is fabulous and it's really cheap because it's a primarily uh, Black neighborhood. So there's a segregation value that is part of um, the opportunity that uh, gentrification can play. The other part of that question of racial segregation and the impact um, is uh, lots of neighborhoods would like to have investment. They would like to have, they might not want the yoga mat store, but you know, they would like uh, businesses, they would like services, amenities. And uh, what you find in many uh, Black communities is those services and amenities are just not available. You're not getting the investment um, in those communities. If I could just interject, Audrey, I knew it was over in Harlem as soon as they opened up a Starbucks. There you go. On 125th Street. <laughs> <laughs> I saw now this is this is like 20 years ago, but I saw a young white woman, blonde hair in a jumpsuit, walking a little dog. And I looked at her like, what what is this? <laughs> this is an apparition. What is going on? Here? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, it, it, it's an aside, but um, some friends of mine in New York actually got into a little bit of a tussle with one of those dog walkers because she was walking down 7th Avenue in a bathing suit. And the sisters like approached her and said, you know, this is inappropriate for our community. We don't want you to do that. And it, it well, it got heated, <laughs> but you know, it's a good example of how people come in, they don't respect values. And then they do, you know, the Starbucks, the dog walking, the dog park, et cetera. Exactly, exactly. So uh, one of the effects of um, gentrification is uh, it's not the investment. So I guess the point I was trying to make is we want investment. We would like our neighborhoods to be desirable, but it's somehow an investment that results in displacement. And the displacement you are talking about is cultural displacement that um, you know, if you have local businesses, they're priced out. Um, the types of businesses that come in are not to your taste or, or affordable. There's clashes on how should the community, um, you know, what should take place? Is it okay to have, um, I heard about a story in DC about a shop that would play music. Yeah, go, go. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the neighbors who's, um, you know, those kind of clashes have happened that happened in Harlem. There was a drum session that would take place week weekly and the uh, neighbors, you know, worked, the new neighbors worked assiduously to make sure that that would, was put to a stop. Mm -hmm. So there's a cultural displacement at the very least, if your uh, original residents can afford to stay and you know maintain themselves in the neighborhood. And the way that they can do that is if there has been public housing, mm. which has for now been immune to uh, the displacement because you have uh, basically guaranteed um, lease to stay in that unit. Um, or if there's uh, rent stabilization or rent, rent control, 
uh, which DC um, has had. So there are, um, uh, my aunt lived in a building in uh, 16th Street and watched it convert. And then uh, her building became nearly entirely affluent white professionals. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But you would see these elderly black people kind of walking in quietly and usually in an isolated way. There, there wasn't any kind of cross communication. It was um, pretty standoffish. Mm. So that would be an example. And mixed income housing is a way to say, well, let's still have our upscale housing or luxury housing, but let's set aside a certain percentage of units uh, that would be subsidized. Usually, you know, for a period of time, those subsidies are going to be for, um, you know, let's say 30 years, which I would say we all know now 30 years can pass uh, pretty quickly. And those uh, units are subsidized and the developer is given a tax incentive. They're allowed to build a bigger building so they can sell more units. And so that has been a way to at least carve out some space in uh, these gentrifying areas. But so, the, so, so let us interrupt you for a second. So is it working? Do you really feel it's working? I mean, I, I, I see the residual effects of it when I travel down the hall and, you know, for, for work or to visit. Uh, but I mean, I don't see it benefiting black people at all. So do you think it works? Um, it works in a limited sense that if you uh, meet the income restriction, you can, it's kind of, I guess, in a way, like a lottery approach to life, which is you may luck out and you may actually have access to a unit and you, you know, it may be fine on an individual level. In the aggregate, as a policy, I don't, um, it, it, it's not going to be up to the challenge, which is we need lots of units of affordable housing. And we've stigmatized uh, public housing because of the way that we went about public housing, uh, such that we think, well, if we build a building and it's all affordable units, then that's going to be, you know, uh, a recipe for disaster. So the mixed income theory is um, if we um, kind of make the units, you can't tell that some of the units might not be as nice as the others. Um, if we make sure the doors are all the same, we won't have the stigma of the low income. Uh, it's, it, can, um, it can lessen community opposition to say this is going to be mixed income. It makes people feel, okay, I won't be stuck next to um, a low income housing. So there's all kinds of uh, issues in terms of like our perceptions and beliefs and prejudices um, that have made us try the mixed income approach rather doesn't, than- do, Doesn't that have very much to do with how we envision low income housing? Like why, you know, that's the question if you drive around New York, right? You can tell which buildings are projects. You don't even have to know that there's something called a project. As soon as you see that building, right. you know that poor people live there. Public right? housing. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. so what is that? Like because it there's pos there's possibilities to do it other ways, right? Absolutely. Why do we make the choice to create housing that looks so horrible for people who are lesser income? Or to follow up on what Michelle is saying, now that we have the issue of so many buildings that are empty since the pandemic. Right. There is tremendous amounts of space all throughout New York City right. for people to just come up with a different way of trying to create space for those that are low income. Right. Right. There's, there are, right, there's space there. Um, some of those buildings were, uh, were empty before the pandemic. Um, there were lots of, uh, let's say, retail space that was emptying out because the landlords were holding out for very high rents and um, no one had taken them up on their offer. 
So, yeah, so the space is there, but how we've arranged, you know, who owns the space, what we think of as the way in which uh, this space should be developed. Is it, a, is it a, in the public interest or is it merely just a matter of, you know, private profit and, you know, what can we make sure that these are profit-making opportunities? All of that um, is, uh, is part of why we are choking and why people are suffering, um, you know, with with these rents, and the rents really indicate that there are not enough units. I, so, I, before we leave the mixed housing issue, I just wanted to have you speak on the experiment they did in New York, where they had a separate door for uh, the. It was a mixed income uh, building, but they actually had a physically separate door for the people who were paying below market rate for the rent. So speak to that. Exactly. So, and and here's the, the, the contrast. So you have an incredibly luxury laden building meant for the super wealthy, but in order to get certain tax breaks to build it, they were forced to build these uh, affordable units. And so they made a separate entrance. And this is not uncommon um, the affordable units in some of these buildings will not have access to the uh, the gym or any of the services that the building provides. Mm -hmm. They separate um, the affordable tenants. And the thinking is, well, you're lucky you're in this prime territory, uh, prime neighborhood you could never, ever afford. And um, the New York Post um, published a story and called it the poor door. Mm. And so um, they, you know. AKA, AKA slave entrance. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And you have some, <laughs> apparently some people thought, look, I'm, I'm ha I am I'm, don't know who this was, but they did quote somebody who said, you know, I, I'm not paying as much, that's fine. Whereas other people were um, rightfully, I think, um, offended and you know read that there was a a message that you are a second class citizen here right. um so that the, the 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 mixed income approach is uh something that is being done in london they're doing it in canada um and this separate door issue um is uh something they've struggled with over there as well so Audrey, you, you mentioned the impact of racial discrimination on housing patterns. And, you know, we all know, right, for decades, Black people were restricted on where they could live. And so it created these areas of intense concentration of Black population, like D.C. Southeast, for example, or in Baltimore, where you have uh, numerous pockets that are completely Black. So if we're talking about fighting against gentrification and also building housing. Why can't we build decent housing where the concentrations of black people are? Why, why do we need to have white people come in in order for those communities to get services or to have decent housing? What, 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 what is that about? Somehow for a variety of reasons, investment follows where white people want to live. And um, I regard gentrification as almost being adopted into the mainstream economy. So all these places where um, are, that are experiencing gentrification are now experiencing this sense that there's a desirable population, that people want to provide services to them, sell to them, and there is a foot or hand put on the scale of kind of making it possible for that population to enter. So you may have a building full of longtime residents. They may be Black or um, they may be lower income. And through um, raising the rents so that they'll leave or not maintaining the buildings, um, you'll uh, drive people out. And so there's a preference that I would say, like the whole society is hypnotized by that somehow that if there are uh, white people who will 
moved to your neighborhood, your neighborhood has been almost like uh, anointed. And I don't have anything more logical to say except that the segregated racial patterns have made that a, an economic decision where whiteness was valued in how neighborhoods were classified for whether or not they would get investment. So under uh, redlining in the 30s, the in, whether or not your neighborhood would be eligible for loans for purchases in your neighborhood was based on, in part, whether or not the neighborhood was white or black. And if it was black, it was marked for disinvestment. And even though those practices, that particular version of the practices have has ended, it still continued. It affected how everything was done, it affected how um, city investment went into where development would take place, who would get the low-income housing built in their communities, who would get uh, single-family housing built in other communities, and it continues to infect the decision-making today. So Not even, to mention the fact that banks are still being held responsible for redlining. Correct, correct. Well, I mean, we're shaking a finger at them, um, and there is the Community Reinvestment Act, which applies when you have a bank merger, um, they have to account for, well, what are you going to do to address this endemic uh, structural racism? And they will engage in partnerships, they will engage in some you know, very positive projects in order to get that rating to be able to engage in the um, that merger. But with respect to why don't we have, you know, why are, why is there such a stark divide that this pattern of racial decision making with respect to investment in land, investment in housing, it's still operating, but in different ways. So we see it when um, you've heard of the appraisal gap or yes the appraisal discrimination, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, how does your house get appraised if they perceive that it is in a black area versus if it's perceived not to be. Um, in terms of how businesses or uh, corporations decide, should we put a family dollar here or should we put a target or should right. we put a Neiman Marcus? Right. Mm -hmm. And they use census data and they have these sophisticated programs that uh, combine the, the race, the educational attainment, the rental costs, the housing prices, and they put that into um, a database that they uh, use to then assign neighbor uh, names to these neighbor neighborhoods. You know, so, you know, thank you. I was going to ask you about that. Sorry, Ray. I know you have a question. No, no, it's okay. Because a friend of mine uh, called me and said, oh, you know, I'm looking at a condo and she, she names an area of DC. And I said, I don't know that. Where, what's the street? And she told me the street. I'm like, that's Columbia Heights, which is a predominantly Latino and Black neighborhood, right? Mm. So she said, no, they're, they're calling it this. I'm like, it's Columbia Heights. It's five blocks from where I live. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. they, they've changed the names of all these little pockets of D.C. Yeah. to make yeah. it seem like it's not attached to the Black and Brown neighborhood. Right. Absolutely. Is. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So, Columbia Heights is probably a name that was meant to set it aside from something else at some point, but now, um, you know, and then, you know, uh, the South Bronx is now Sobro. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, <laughs> geodemographic profiling that I was talking about, which is how these businesses decide where to locate, they actually will name uh, the, so picture, uh, let's say, uh, Northwest DC with the large homes, uh, that might be called Blue Blood Estates. And then um, a place, um, is there a place called Detroit? Yes, Detroit Park. Yeah, uh, they might call that Mid-City Blues. And they mm -hmm. have, um, in the suburbs, they have one called Kids and Cul-de-Sacs. Um, and so they label these areas with these marketing profiles. And mm -hmm. then um, 
that's what you then pitch to the the, the stores do these studies mm -hmm. um, before they um, decide where to locate. And so where you can identify that you're going to have affluent people then that's how they make their decisions. Interesting. And so that's why uh, Prince George's County, I mean, it's changed now with Prince George's County to a certain extent, but Prince George's County is affluent and black um, and they could not get any of the major department stores to locate in the county because there was just a perception that, well, um, it's, it's black. So um, what you're going back to the economic um, aspect of, of gentr gentrification um, in an, in an article in New York times in 21, only 26% of black households in the city were owned by black folks. And then white households was like 42%, 39, almost 40% for Asian households and 15% for Hispanic. So what kind of issues do they have trying to keep their homes as these property values go up. And now maybe, you know, the money is so good for them. They, they want to sell, they have to sell in order to reap the benefits of that. However, they're probably not going to be selling to a black family or an Hispanic family or an Asian family for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So one of the ways that displacement can take place is because of the property taxes. So, the uh, increased uh, assessed valuation eventually can drive people out just through being unable to pay the property taxes. Um, and so there are ways that you can try to keep those taxes down, you know, by deciding, you know, if you are coming up with another designation that if you were an original resident or um, having some kind of tax abatement based on age, they sometimes will have a discount based on uh, being elderly. Uh, but what we're just seeing is having the market and these market values that I think we want the price to go up if we view our homes as an investment. But the price going up has uh, some negative consequences that we haven't fully reckoned with as a matter of policy. But that may be, Audrey, but if the home now, let's, there was an article, another article I read about a elderly gem, gentleman in Brooklyn in the Crown Heights area who was, wants to sell his home. His son can't buy it because it's too expensive. He's probably going to get around $2 million for that brownstone in Crown Heights. How can anyone, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I mean, you have to have it fantastic credit you have to have a bank that's willing to support you and believe in you and have done the history that you're going to be eligible and you're going to pay back all that mortgage i mean that's just not in the cards for most of us right right and so uh, a lot of people will sell plain and simple and that's why they're so you have a brownstone you own it truly wonderful there need to be other housing options where, uh, so for example, um, community land trusts have been attempted, which is we're going to really remove this appreciation, this price appreciation from the equation. So the unit or the house is sold to someone, uh, but under a understanding that they will only make a certain amount of money if they sell. And then when they do sell, the idea is that that will keep the unit affordable for the next person. And it's a community land trust because the organization owns the underlying land and only sells off the unit, um, uh, the improvements uh, to the land. Yeah. So there are all kinds of approaches that they work if you happen to be lucky enough that approach was put together for you. But there just seems to be a overarching problem of there's only but so many brownstones. So maybe there will be high demand. 
but it should be the case that there is an option to find a perfectly fine place to live um, that provides you shelter and provides you access to be able to go to work and, you know, to be able to, you know, seek out, meet your needs. And we have not thought about doing that in a way that um, is, I'd say, workable. We right. focus, we yeah. focused on, I, I feel like we want this situation. We want the price appreci appreciation. I don't even think we mind people being evicted or forced from their homes. Right. Well, that's predatory capitalism, right? Mm. <laughs> it, it's all mm. part of how you make money. Mm. But there, there are other choices. And I appreciate the fact that you mentioned there was a lack of uh, coherent policy on this particular issue. Um, and I'm just I'm going to give a quick example and then I'm going to ask you uh, two questions to wrap it up. Um, so there are other ways, right? If you value the humanity of the group for which you are pro providing housing. So we, we've historically had a um, homeless shelter, uh, right? Not too far from where I live. And when the area was uh, gentrified, uh, they tried to get rid of, the city wanted to get rid of the shelter and the community fought. The community that was originally here fought that. Uh, so they adopted a plan. And whenever I have visitors from out of town, I walk them down that street and I say, point out the building that is the shelter. And they cannot because they built it out of the same materials as the luxury housing apartment building that's next to it. Mm -hmm. So it just looks like it's a part of the luxury housing, but it's a freaking homeless shelter, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. where, where they decided to treat the people with dignity right. and to allow them to live in a decent environment. So it's, it's possible to do, but yeah. the government has to make the decision that the lives of those people are worth planning and spending and valuing. But so let me ask you yeah, this. Let's um, hope we don't have to be homeless in order to get that done, well, though, Michelle. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that may be coming too. Um, so, Audrey, uh, we, we, we're coming to the end. So uh, we have a famous last question we asked. But uh, before we get to it, I want to know, is there anything communities can do to stem the tide or prevent the initiation of the displacement through uh, gentrification? You can form a community land trust. You can uh, form a housing organization. You can engage in development yourself. If you are a tenant um, in a building that um, you um, fear might be sold, uh, in DC, you have the right of first refusal. Uh, if you can organize the other tenants, get legal representation, get financing, you can buy <laughs> the the uh, building itself. So those kinds of tools um, to allow, I guess, self-help or to allow people to um, engage if they're far enough ahead of the gentrification wave um, is an approach, but it has to be something, it almost has to be that while you're in the neighborhood and it is depressed and you're like, if we could only get some development here, you have to think of, if we succeed, there needs to be something put into place to allow a kind of long-term viability for people to remain in place, either as owners or as renters. But there just needs to be more housing built. And some of it needs to be in the suburbs. Some of it needs to be in the city. Um, and there's been, uh, what we also need to think about is gentrification is happening, you know, in some places and other places would die with happiness if they could have uh, that kind of investment uh, and development taking place. And part of the shortage of affordable housing is not just what's happening in the cities, but it's also what's happening in the suburbs with exclusionary zoning, where they've been allowed to build exclusively single family home uh, jurisdictions uh, or large homes. Um, and they need to uh, allow housing to be built um, in their jurisdictions as well. 
Right. And there's more of a recognition of that need. Um, a couple of jurisdictions have said, um, we're not going to allow more single family homes to be built. We need multifamily ranging from, you know, duplexes to uh, apartment buildings. So there, um, there's a recognition, but in some cases it's pretty difficult. Like a place like San Francisco, the uh, is, is it's it's stunning, isn't it beautiful? Those yeah. houses are beautiful, yeah, yeah. but that's why they have an affordable housing issue because okay. there's not enough housing to meet the need. Yeah. Okay, that, so, so that's been fascinating. There's so many questions we haven't even been uh, able to get to. I, I would, would have wanted to talk about how transportation. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, and, and I wanted to talk about education and how yeah. education. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we don't have time. We don't have time. Okay. <laughs> so maybe you'll come back for a part two at some point. Anytime. Okay, but let, let's ask the wrap-up question, which we ask all of our guests. Uh, I don't know how it would apply in the gentrification context, but we normally ask them, you know, as as we're heading out to towards the end of the show, what's the takeaway that you want our audience to get? If they don't understand anything of what you said today, what's the one thing? And please got? don't depress us any more than we already are. <laughs> <laughs> what's the takeaway, Audrey? <laughs> I look at gentrification as when we talk about inequality and it's this abstract term, gentrification is when inequality comes down to the ground and we see it being uh, carried out in space, in real mm. places. Mm. Um, and so if you know, if you have the luxury, take a step back and say, this is what how inequality works out on the ground. Um, and that's why it has to be addressed. That's perfect. That's perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming and talking with us, Audrey. That Terrific, was just, Audrey. That was just fantastic. And as you can see, it impacts all the areas where we live, in Baltimore, in D.C., in New York, oh, yes. in right. California. Right. Our listeners, no matter where they are, know that this is a significant issue that we all have to deal with. So thank you so much. And, and we're going to be on you to come back and talk about oh, yeah. the transportation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and have something to, to, to talk and about. And our kids and our, how our kids yeah. are being affected by gentrification yeah. in our communities. That's a whole nother hour. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. But we want to thank you for coming and opening the door to help us understand um, what's underneath these issues that are impacting our communities so badly. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. So, Michelle, I, I've learned so much about, well, first of all, the lack of home ownership, you know, in, in urban areas. I think I knew about that. I didn't know how dramatic it was in comparison to, uh, to white people, black people, um, you know, Hispanic people, Asian people. And I think that there, there is so much that is needed to be done here that some of the suggestions that uh, Professor McFarlane uh, had for us on this episode were uh, really intriguing. Well, and the whole gentrification issue, right? The, the, the housing issue was already a problem. Yeah. But uh, the gentrification push to take us out of our communities yes, yes. Um, is really scary. And the, when she said that uh, when the yoga mats come out, it's already too late. Um, was right, really right, right. To me, right? It was mm -hmm. really striking. So I'm, um, I'm hoping that uh, more people will pay attention to some of the suggestions she's making, uh, and become more invested in getting out ahead. Especially, the... especially coming together and forming those community groups yeah, to yeah. be able to combat what's going on in your neighborhood. Right, right, exactly, right. Great show. It was a great show, and I'm so happy she was able to join us. If you enjoyed what you heard today, visit our website, NubianTigersPodcast.com. In addition to the podcast, we also post a resource page for each subject to provide additional sources of information. We're also on YouTube on the Nubian Tigers Podcast channel. Our podcast is hosted by Anchor FM, but if you have a favorite podcast app, we're probably on it. Just look for Nubian Tigers Talk. Looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you next time.
Wake up, wake up, wake up.